Hi everyone, welcome to our 34th seminar of the Center of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm John Pierce, postdoctoral researcher at the Aphasia CRE and co-facilitator of this seminar series. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and our, many of our participants are located on the lands of traditional custodians in Australia. Today, I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri land and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us online today. Very much looking forward today to hearing from Dr. Annie Hill, who is joining us from Brisbane. And Annie's presenting, actually debuting the preliminary findings from the first ICAP to be delivered via tele rehab. Um, but before I introduce Annie, I'll just cover some housekeeping. If you haven't already done so, please join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE community of practice. Uh, we welcome people with aphasia or their family, or friends, health professionals, researchers, and organizations. And benefits to members include a regular newsletter, updates about events, activities, contributions to research, networking opportunities, and more. And the CRE is always looking for financial support. So if you wish to donate, please see our website for details. Please note that this seminar is being recorded and you can find this and other videos on the Aphasia CRE website. You just click on our resources tab. And while you're there, there are lots of other helpful resources related to aphasia. Now, during today's recording, we may be editing out some of the videos that include participants with aphasia. So if you are watching this as a recording, you might just notice a, a jump in places where those videos are edited out. You can connect with the CRE on social media via Twitter and Facebook, and you're welcome today to tweet along um, as Annie presents and use the hashtag AphasiaCRE. Now, hopefully this seminar will spark lots of questions and you can write your questions in the Q&A function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please don't use the chat box for questions because I won't see them there. Um, you can enter your question for Dr. Hill at any time throughout the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end and you'll be able to see the questions from other audience members and like or upvote a question if uh, it's of interest to you. Um, at the end of the presentation, Dr. Hill will answer as many questions as time allows. Um, and we just ask that you reserve that Q&A space for questions only, um, keep them brief and, and please don't make comments in the Q&A box. Okay, it's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Annie Hill. Dr. Hill is a speech pathologist and the senior conjoint research fellow between the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Queensland and the Surgical Treatment and Rehabilitation Services STARS in Metro North Health in Brisbane, Queensland. Annie is the leading researcher of telerehabilitation in aphasia and has a keen interest in the use of technology to enable evidence-based therapy for communication disorders. She's the co-author of the Speech Pathology Australia Position Statement on Telepractice and the Principles of Practice Guide for Telepractice. Annie, I'll hand over to you now. Great, thank you very much, John. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so thank you all very much. Um, this is a very busy screen, I know, but I just wanted to um, I guess, hi highlight all of the various um, centres that I have been part of over the years, um, all of which has contributed to the work that I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge the extensive research team that we have. Right. Now it's working. Okay. Lovely. Okay. <laughs> so what is tele tele telechat? So telechat is an i is an i cap delivered via via tele. And I'm using this lovely diagram by Miranda. Um, for those who perhaps don't know what an i cap is 
but it's a therapy that involves multiple goals and approaches. It's delivered in a high intensity and it's for a certain length of time. Now we know from, the, from some recent work that there's many of these types of therapies being delivered around the world, but they all have different lengths of time and are made up of different types of therapy. So what is the therapy that telechat is developed from? Well, it's called CHAT, which stands for Comprehensive High Dose Aphasia treat Treatment. So this is 50 hours across eight weeks, and those 50 hours are made up of, in, of impairment functioning computer-based and psychosocial group therapy. Rather importantly, all of this is goal-centered, evidence-based, personally tailored, and involves family givers, caregivers, family, and friends. So telechat is um, quite a large piece of work. Um, it began with the translation from chat to telechat, the development of a training package for both the people who deliver it as well as those who receive it, and the, in, and the investigation of the usability, feasibility, and acceptability. All of that work, which has got the yellow stars against it, has been done by the incredible Genevieve Bion, who's the PhD student who has um, led this piece of work. Today, I'm talking about the, the preliminary findings of the clinical out, outcomes from, tele, from telechat. But before we dive in, dive into that, I really want to talk to you about the work that Jen has done in taking us from the in-person chat to tele to telechat. Jen has done an incredible piece of work using the human-centered design frame, framework, which is an, an iterative process looking at what every user needs in order to enable the therapy to take place, producing a technology configura configuration that enables that, testing to make sure that the tech does what it says that it will, and then making sure that that meets those users' needs. Now, central to all of this has been a task analysis. And this is where Jen has taken therapy tasks and really broken them down into what is going on here. What is the interaction that is happening between the clinician, the person with aphasia and family if they're part of that. Then she has looked for the tech features that will enable that interaction to happen through video conferencing. So Jen has done this for a range of, of, in, of impairment and functioning therapy, computer-based and group. Now our group therapy is multi-point video conferencing. So each of the each of the participants are in their own home. Um, so we would have a connection of between five or six different um, sites. What this task analysis has done has enabled Jen to then come up with a list of critical tech features. These are the features that are needed in order for telechat to be delivered. She has then looked at six different tech options. So these are video conferencing um, systems, and she has looked to see whether they contain those tech features. Now these are color, color coded, green being it's there, the tech feature is there, it works really well. Yellow is that the tech feature 
is there, but it might not be as easy to use, or it's there, but it's turned off. And red being that that tech feature either isn't there or it's there, but it's really difficult to use. So it's not actually functional. So Jen did this for a range of tech features that she felt were critical and then some that she thought would be really nice to have. And that's what these, um, these yellow ones are down here. <clears throat> She then looked at whether these options were available or what their, their cost is. Now, this is the piece of work that will change over time. So this work is now about 18 months old. And so it may soon be time to go back to each of these options to see if they've brought on some of these tech features that would enable the therapy to be done or if they're still not um, not available. So that task analysis has really enabled Jen and then Hannah to be able to to translate evidence-based therapies to be used in telechat. And here we just have some examples of the types of therapies that are able to be delivered. So as I said today, I'm going to be presenting to you the preliminary clinical effectiveness data of telechat. So the participants are people with aphasia and if they have a support person, um, they have to be at least one month post stroke. Um, and they have to have access to some basic tech, but more importantly, they have to have an internet connection because everything is done um, over that. So just in terms of what the participant with aphasia does when they come into tele, into tele chat, we do all of our testing, our pre-testing in the four weeks prior. Um, we started off with our testing being done in person in the person's home um, with COVID and a variety of other reasons. We have moved everything to being delivered via tele. We then do goal setting. So this is personalised patient-centred goal setting. Um, and then from that, mapping across to therapy tasks. And part of that therapy planning involves the tech that we'll need. The person with aphasia is then trained on the tech that they'll need. Um, we tend to like to use whatever devices they have. However, if they need um, access to um, certain types of devices, we are at times able to um, lend that. They then do tele, tele chat for eight weeks um, and at the end of which we test them again. I have a lovely, very sometimes teary chat with them about how they found tele chat. Um, and we do have a follow-up point, which is three months post. However, I'm not sharing that data today. So just in terms of the the assessments that that we do pre telechat, we um, ask people about their confidence in using tech, and that's just part of a general sort of case history. We do the CAT, the scenario test, the communication confidence rating scale for aphasia, the the SETI, and then the stroke and aphasia quality of life. 39. We repeat those at both the post tele chat and follow up period. I just wanted to share with you and those of you who were at the clinical forum that was presented last week will have seen this, but this is just a really nice um, 
a really nice table that shows you how we move from goal setting through to therapy planning through to the technology that's needed to actually deliver that therapy. So here you can see the goal, which is to retrieve words. You can see the various therapy types that are going to be used both at impairment and functional level. And here you can see the tech that we're going to use to deliver those specific therapies. Here is another goal, um, and this is a slightly different, different um, goal in that it was to write birthday cards. At first, the team thought, well, we'll use text, so we'll have to type. But in fact, what happened with this, and I'll show you this a little bit later on, is that the, um, the goal was really to hand was to hand write and so we used the tech to enable that and so that in that involved using secondary devices as cameras so after we have done all of this we then train the person with aphasia and their support person if if they have if they have one um, and we leave this training to this point because by now we know what tech they're going to need to use and so we can train them on that. But they get a three hour either in person or via Zoom training session and we can break that up into smaller um, sessions. But basically it takes them through the technology um, setup. It, they have practice using the features that they'll need to use during the therapy tasks. Um, they're trained in how to manage any tech errors or emergencies. And we have a whole heap of cheat, cheat sheets. In the development of, tele, of telechat, we have really put the technology responsibility or burden onto the uh, SLP. So the SLP gets a two hour self paced online uh, module in which they learn about why you would do a task analysis for therapy tasks and how that's done. Um, they can see how to set up and use the various types of tele chat tech. Um, it goes through how to manage common tech errors um, and there's some tips on how to deliver a usual tele, tele chat um, uh, session. There's also some tips on how they can support the person with, with aphasia using uh, Zoom. <clears throat> they then go on to do a two hour uh, crap, I guess, which is either in person or via Zoom. And this is where we use a case to do a mock therapy um, session, as well as a mock trouble, troubleshooting um, session. And there's lots of practice using various Zoom features. And rather importantly, we have a Q&A um, session where they can say, I'm having difficulty doing such and such, and the trainer is able to talk them through that. So on to the results. These are our first 16. Um, I'm about to show you a much condensed demographic slide, but just so that you can see the types of stroke and lesion sites, um, this was a group of people who had had quite a lot of schooling. But our first 16, um, six women and 10 men, a mean age of 62 years, but a very broad range from 24 to 81. Time post onset of 33 months, but again, a very big 
range of between two to 170 months. This group had very um, not great tech competence. So on a rating scale of one to five, where one is very low and five is very high, the mean was about three. Um, so a little over three, so slightly more confident than not. Of these 16, 14 support people were part of this. Um, and I guess the interesting thing about this group is that only four of those people had ever used telehealth before, but 12 of them had used video conferencing. So that's probably something like face, face, FaceTime or something like that. From our map, you can see that we have been treating people down the East Coast, including in Victoria, Tasmania, and New South Wales. Um, so that's why our transition across to doing all of our testing via, via tele was so, was so critical. Um, and so there are people who have been part of this that we've never met in person. So I'm now gonna show you some basic graphs and then the stats. So this is the comprehensive aphasia test. These are the total modality scores for the first six, 16. Um, you can see that everyone bar the two that are starred have made some sort of gain. Um, just take a note of who these couple of people are. This is number four, number 11. Um, and then if we look at the communication confidence rating scale for aphasia, we can see that most people are rating themselves as feeling more com confident, except for a couple. Again, number four, and this time number 13 here. If we look at our quality of life measure, we can see again that most people are, are reporting again, except for a few. Again, number four here, number 13 again, and this time number 15. If we then look at the at the SETI, which is our which is our proxy rating, um, and we have a couple of people who didn't have this done. But you can see that all of our all of our our proxies are feeling that the person with a with aphasia has actually gotten better. So on to the statistical analysis. So this is the preliminary data. Uh, I have done a very basic paired sample T test. This is on the total score. So if we look at the cash, we can see that we have a significant, a statistically significant improvement. And we have that for all of the other measures as well. The effect sizes are rather large. Even with a correction, they're still they're still very large. Now the SETI and SAQUEL data was not normal. We had quite a few outliers. Um, so I decided to do a very conservative, non-parametric related sample sign test on those pieces of data. And as you can see here, we're still getting a statistically significant result. I then wanted to delve a little bit deeper into the cache. Um, so I have done a paired sample t-test on each of the sub the sub tests. And as you can see, we have statistically significant results for all of the sub all of the subtests bar writing. The effect sizes are large, except for these median 
medium ones which relate to comprehension of spoken and written language. So, Telechat is the first ICAT to be delivered fully via Tele, and our preliminary data on the first 16 is, in, is encouraging with statistically significant improvements across the total, the total scores on a standardised language measure, a self a self-reported communication confidence measure, self self-reported quality of life, and our proxy ratings of language. So this is great, and this is kind of in line with what we're seeing from some other work being done. Um, the Queen Square, I, I cap, and chat in stars. So what are the factors that might be bringing about these positive these positive results? Well, the first thing I think is that Genevieve Byung has done a highly sophisticated translation of chat into tele, tele chat. I think her very thorough task analysis and using the human-centered design um, system has enabled the translation of a large number of evidence-based therapies to be delivered via tele. The iterative nature of this has allowed the team to refine the tech that's being used and to come up with different solutions when faced with a, with a new challenging goal. I also think that it re has really helped that we've been able to use Zoom, which currently is the most flexible and easy to use of video conferencing systems. The other factor I think is that the training, and I think it's the thorough task analysis that has led to really great training. Um, the fact that the clinicians are trained in the tech features and they get to practice the trouble, you know, the troubleshooting, the training of the participants and their support people, and the fact that that training is really tailored to what their needs are. Some other factors I think are the design of our actual telechat service, I guess. And I guess we're able to do this in a more flexible way because we're not doing it within a health service. So we're able to just do four participants per group. Um, we have dedicated sessions to goal setting and we're happy to go back and really hone those goals down to um, something that is able to be uh, achieved. We have a dedicated holistic clinical planning session where we move from goal mapping that across to evidence-based therapies and looking at the tech that is going to actually enable that. We also have weekly sessions where the clinicians and these two clinicians are treating all of those patients, so they swap, so they hand over and they talk through any either therapy issues or uh, tech. We also have a midway clinical planning review just to check in, make sure that we're still on track. The other part is that the tele-delivery of this allows for a certain amount of flexibility in terms of making up sessions. So that's the actual tele-chat kind of overall sort of service. I also think that the tele-chat sessions are slightly different as well, perhaps. And part of that's because we've got really talented clinicians who are patient-centered, calm, flexible. The other thing that they do within that um, session is the very first thing that they do is check in to see whether that 
participant is motivated to be doing therapy. The patients that I've talked that I've talked to love this. They talk about it almost being a priming sort of, you know, effect that they suddenly feel ready, ready to go. The other thing that we do as part of our telechat sessions is we is we give the option for the patient to select the goal that they'd like to work on. But most importantly, our clinicians intentionally develop rapport. I just want to remind you that they're treating people who they have never met in person. And yet the, the sense of being connected is tangible. A couple of other factors. I think that there's some specific benefits to receiving therapy via tele. And part of that is because you're getting it in your own home. There's no travel. Um, so I think that participants are potentially feeling less stressed, potentially they're not as tired. There's certainly less costs for, you know, for them. Uh, they're in their own home environment. Um, it's perhaps easier for family and friends to be part of the session. And maybe, and we have no evidence for this at all, but maybe it enables quicker translation from therapy task to daily life. Because of the flexibility of delivery via tele, all of the participants were able to achieve dose. So the other part of this is that we have a dedicated team of people who work like this. So our clinicians are using the technology on a daily basis. And they've talked about how in the early, early days, it took a lot of effort, but that has reduced over, over time. And now they can focus much more on the clinical part of their job. So a couple of limitations. Um, this is a very small sample, 16 only. Um, I think there's probably some bias in the sample as well. These are people who are self selecting in terms of being motivated to do an intensive therapy and also having the courage to do that via tech, which they may not know how to actually use. Um, the other thing is that we've only used Zoom. So in terms of being able to translate this quickly and easily into, into health um, services, that's, that's a major um, limiting factor. Future directions, um, we're going to continue to deliver telechat for at least the next 12 months and we will continue to collect this type of data. Um, as we get a larger group, we'd like to go in and identify those who are really responding and if there are any factors that we think might be um, leading to that. I'm very keen to compare the telechat data with the chat in person data um, so that we can say that telechat is not inferior to the in-person version. Um, Jen is has all of her data now and is currently writing that up. So um, that will all be out soon. We also have um, a new intervention called Chat Main Chat Maintain, which is being led by Dr. Jess Campbell. And this follows on from chat and tele chat uh, to guide the person with aphasia to maintain their gains and to and to move towards self-management. And that's all tech uh, enabled. Oops, it's gone too fast. Uh, so I guess the next piece of work that I'd like to move to is looking at what we need to do to get tele 
tele chat into health services and or private practice or other um, uh, settings. So we need to look at what the barriers and enablers are. So this will be following on from some other work that's been done looking at these intensives and uh, what the barriers are for those in-person versions. When it comes to the tele version, I think we um, need to be talking to business managers, directors of service, the people who decide on the models of care, and importantly, the IT decision makers. Because we really need to have the right tech available to the end users. Uh, Telechat is part of a NHMRC partnership grant, which looks to put chat into various health um, services. And what was quite pleasing was that those health services had actually asked if there could be parts of chat that were delivered via tele. So that's great that people are keen to move to this model of care. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge the the funding that we've had for the telechat work, which has come from the Queensland Aphasia Re Research Centre and the University of, Queen of Queensland. Um, so that's been funding for our SLPs as well as PhD scholarship. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the CRE Aphasia, who I previously worked for when we started all of this um, and all of the in-kind support that we have had. And should you have anybody who you think would benefit from telechat, you can direct them to our Quark web website or ask them to get in touch at quark at uq.edu.au. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annie. We're very lucky to be, you know, the first forum you've presented these preliminary results at. So thanks for taking us through them. Um, you know, it's it's quite a it's quite a lot of work, it's probably an understatement. And um, you know, it's it's one program, but it's it's so many different treatments within that and so many different procedures. So I guess it shows just how kind of thoughtful you have to be to adapt something to telehealth properly. Um, I encourage people to enter some questions as we go, but I'm going to open with mine just because I can. So, um, of course, this program and, and your research in telehealth predates, you know, telehealth being cool. Uh, <laughs> obviously, the pandemic has made kind of um, enforced people to use it. I just wonder how that um, that increase in telehealth use uh, affected the trial at all. Do you think it made it easier to recruit people or easier to find therapists or uh, more difficult in some ways it's very it's very difficult to say because we began the treatment phase during covid right. um, we were certainly able to continue right through so um when we had periods when we were all working from home all of our clinicians were able to work from home still and deliver this from home mm. um so it's very difficult to say. Um, I think <laughs> um, I have I have worked in this area for many many years, and mm. um, it felt like people didn't really care about telehealth or see the benefits of it. And then COVID came and made it really glaringly obvious that this was needed. Um, so anyway, it's a shame that it took a pandemic, but it's great <laughs> that we were primed, ready to go, yes. and had the um, years of work that enabled us to be able to do, you know, to do this. Yep. Yep. Um, a few questions coming through. Nelson Hernandez asking, were there any interviews conducted on participants' feelings or thoughts towards the program once completed? Yes, definitely. Uh, and that data is going to take us a little bit of time to get through. Typically, those are hour-long sessions. Um, the interviews? Yes, they right. are. Um, so, 
and I've and I've done all of those so I can tell you from just in a general sense that they are very very positive they've also had some really good ideas about things that we could perhaps change um mm. in terms of things like um you know we've been asked this uh previously if people get too too tired um and some people have talked about that about feeling really tired after their couple of sessions every day um but the fact that they're at home is that they can just go and have a nap you know uh there's no traveling back home uh people have also talked about feeling relaxed um they haven't gotten stressed because they've had to travel some somewhere dealing with traffic mm. um, their family can get on with whatever they need need to do um so there's yeah there's some really nice positive data coming out of that yeah yep and i guess less less driving for the for the spouse if there is one or family or absolutely yeah um, another question from Nelson, had any of the participants completed a traditional ICAP prior to telechat? One had, yes. Um, and we're still, so he was in our very last group. I um, think he's the only one who's done a, who's done a traditional one previously. Mm. Um, yeah. So that interview might be extra interesting. Yes, and he's young and very, um, very tech savvy. So yes, I think yep. we'll learn a lot. Yeah. Um, Kathleen Mellon's asking, do you think the initial, do you think the initial three hours of pre telechat training for the people with aphasia could occur, hundred percent online? Um, yes, I think it did. Is that right? Some, some of it, some of it does. Yes. Um, yep. So, yeah, so those people who are quite remote from us, absolutely everything is done via Zoom. Yep. And if if they can't get onto Zoom in the first instance, is that a phone call or? Yeah, definitely. So um, the other thing that Jen has done is a beautiful risk analysis with a risk plan. Uh, so yes we know exactly who, who who to call um we always talk to people first on the phone and then mm. kind of scale it up from that i guess through to zoom um and if they're having difficulties getting on getting on to zoom then we're on on the phone a big hint um which jen and hannah talked about last week was it really helps if you as the clinician know what the person with aphasia is seeing at their end and it's mm. slightly different so when mm. you're delivering therapy to them they're going to have a slightly different view so you need to build in some time practicing being the patient end as well yep i, I know i've been telling someone you know press the green button but on a on a ipad it's not visible unless you press something else um, Regina Fitzpatrick's asking, could you please elaborate on the motivation check-in? What questions were asked of clients? That's a rating scale of one, one to five, just how motivated they are to do therapy for that particular um, session. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's nothing else. Um, but patients have at least talked with me about the fact that they really liked that. Um, I think it also opens the door to a bit more of that rapport building type chat as well. So, you know, if someone's saying, if they rate themselves as a three or a two, then you're not just going to leave it at that. You might ask why and kind of delve in a bit, you know, a little bit yep. more. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is, um, and I'm sure that that's done in loads of other therapy therapy types I just think that when you are remote from the patient and you potentially are not going to be getting all of the you know the body language mm. cues you need to intentionally be asking things like like that 
Yeah. Yeah. And if they're sitting in a, a dark room or something, you're getting even, even less information. Yeah. Um, Nelson asked whether there are any common factors in participants that didn't show improvement. We haven't looked at that yet. That will be our very next phase of yep. the data uh, analysis. Yeah. Katarina Brattenstein said, thank you for an inspiring talk. Do you have an estimate how much therapy time had to be allocated to solving tech problems, which presumably did occur? Yes, indeed. Um, so Jen has been, um, has been presenting this data on the first 12 and the average is less than two minutes per um, session. So that's, you know, an average. There were some people where they had more um, and often that I believe was due to where they lived um, the, and it's usually the connection, whether or not they have a stable high speed co uh, connection. Some people have been doing this off their phone, not in terms of the actual, the therapy, but doing it through their phone data. Mm -hmm. um, We've had people living in car caravans. Um, so sometimes if it's very wet, that's not ideal for a connection. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these other factors. Um, but yeah, it, we've had, I guess, surprisingly few issues. Yeah, two minutes is quite good. I mean, we've had more than two minutes of problems today in our seminar. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering, I know you did touch on this, but how, how easily do you think this could be ported onto other, you know, video conferencing platforms? You, you said that they, they're changing over time with what they offer, but, but are there any that you think are good candidates or? Yeah, so this is, um, so this is a piece of work that is being pushed, um, was well, certainly being pushed up here and not just by us, but there's many people who are asking our health service who have their own telehealth portal to please build in the features that you know that mm. we um, need and they're very open to doing that it's just going to take time yep. um, so as I said I think I think we're we're pretty much at a point where we probably need to go back and review all of those options and see if there's anything new and what tech features it has available um, and and or continue to look at other ways to use Zoom in a more secure manner if that's what the issue is. Yep. Okay, Regina has also asked, she mistakenly missed the start of the session, can she see the full session recording? Yes, Regina, I'm glad you asked. We the full recording will be available within a few weeks on the aphasia CRE resources page. So um, you can jump on there and watch that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Annie, for sharing today. As I said, it's, it's a real honor to hear those results before anyone else. Oh, that's not the screen you want to see. Um, thanks. thanks very much to all of you for the chance to um, share them. Pleasure. And uh, next seminar will be Dr. Willemann Doydens, who will be presenting on everyday communication in aphasia rehabilitation. And that's scheduled for the 14th of September. So um, if you want to hear the details of that, make sure you're signed up to our community of practice. Thanks once again, Annie. Thank you.